talking about Nietzsche. Um, my introduction will probably take more than today's class. we will spill over into Wednesday. Um, but I'll finish it on Wednesday, and then we'll start talking about the genealogy. So for Wednesday, you should read the preface. Um, so the genealogy is not very long. Um, here is page one through seven, the first page. Nietzsche uh, lived from 1844 to 1900, um, but his last work was completed um, just days before he collapsed and insane in January of 1899. He was 44 years old, um, and probably his uh, insanity was um, brought about due to syphilis. And during his productive life, um, he was almost completely neglected. Um, he had to pay for the publication of some of his works himself. Um, but soon after his breakdown, soon after his psychological collapse, he became a kind of cult figure. Um, and since his death, He's been claimed to be a kind of inspiration to just about every kind of political or cultural group you can think of, from Nazis to anarchists to socialists, from um, radical environmentalists to reactionary and to modernists, just about everybody. Um, really, the diversity of interpretations um, and groups claiming him to be an inspiration is really amazing. Um, in the first half of the 20th century, his work was not the object of serious scholarly study, at least in the Anglo-American philosophical um, and there were many reasons for this, but two are probably the most important I want to mention to you. Um, first, the English translations of his work in the first half of the 20th century were horrible. Um, and some were, in fact, based on forgeries, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and second, um, during World War II, and actually just before World War II, um, the Nazis claimed him as a kind of semi-official philosopher and inspiration. So I'll talk about that also. Um, it wasn't until 1950 that um, the first edition of a book by the philosopher Walter Kaufman, um, the book was called Nietzsche, Philosopher, Psychologist, Antichrist, was published. Um, and soon after that, Kaufman began uh, producing his own translations into English of uh, Nietzsche's works. And uh, this guy, Walter Kaufman, really basically single-handedly uh, made the phil philosophical study of Nietzsche respectable in Anglo-American philosophy. But what I want to emphasize, that only started in 1950. And so, the sort of scholarly attention to Nietzsche's work has been very, very recent. Um, as you may know, Nietzsche's writing is often very, very polemical. Um, it's sometimes ad hominem. Um, and it's always very vigorous and powerful. And so you might imagine that he was a sort of cruel and domineering personality, but he, in fact, almost all accounts um, say that he was a very shy man, um, very polite, um, and uh, kind. Um, for most of his adult life, he suffered really debilitating illnesses. He had terrible migraines that lasted days at a time, and he was profoundly lonely. After his breakdown, um, his the sort of legend of his work spread, and we get all kinds of 
We get all kinds of crazy accounts of supposedly his heroic character, again, including <coughs> several forged letters um, that were apparently produced by his sister. Most of his adult life he lived in Switzerland during the summers and then moved to the uh, French or uh, Italian Riviera for the winters for his health. Um, after his insanity, his sister established the Nietzsche archive um, and retained copyrights on his work, on his publications, um, which she guarded very carefully and prevented independent scholars from examining these papers. Um, and she <coughs> dedicated herself to promoting his legend and his fame, including for the forgeries that I just alluded to, and I'll talk about this more later. Um, but the short story is that she, his sister, was um, was herself an anti-Semite, was married to a notorious anti-Semite, um, and she suppressed and distorted his work in order to make it look like he was one, too. Um, and she tried and eventually succeeded in sort of ingratiating herself and her brother, uh, by then dead brother, to the Nazis. Um, and so that's where that connection came from. So I'll talk about that. Um, Nietzsche, probably more than any other philosopher, maybe since Plato, um, is very, very deliberate and careful in his writing style, or should I say styles. Um, because one of the many unusual things about Nietzsche is that he adopts different styles in different books. Um, so he's probably best known for his aphorisms, so these are brief, very, very dense slogans. And some of his books, as I'll describe in a minute, are composed entirely of aphorisms, so are numbered sections that are, are very brief. But most of his work is not aphoristic. The genealogy, for example, is not a work of aphorism. Um, one of the serious problems in the secondary literature is the tendency to try to rip out these aphorisms out of their context. Um, and this is something that um, is a great temptation and in fact has been defended by well-known philosophers. So here's how one well-known and important um, Nietzsche scholar talks about this. This is on the first page of a fairly well-known book about Nietzsche. He says this. He says, this a, a, a philosopher named is Arthur Doctor. Uh, he says, Nietzsche's books give the appearance of having been assembled rather than composed. They are made up in the main of short pointed aphorisms and of essays seldom more than a few pages long. Each volume is more like a treasury of the author's selection than like a book in its own right. Any given aphorism or essay might as easily have been placed in one volume as in another without much affecting the unity or structure of either. And the books themselves do not exhibit any special structure as corpus. No one of them presupposes an acquaintance, acquaintance with any other. Although, although there undoubtedly was a development in Nietzsche's thought and his style, his writings may be read in pretty much any order without greatly impeding the comprehension of his ideas. I think that just about everything that Danto says in that passage is wrong, completely wrong. That Nietzsche put together the individual books, for the most part, very carefully. And the context of individual aphorisms matters a lot. And I think that over the course of his, of his uh, productive career, his view changed in dramatic and important ways. And so taking uh, quotes from one context of one book and uh, substituting into another um, uh, is 
really doing violence to his own development. Um, there are, in fact, there are explicit connections between his books when he refers back to them. Um, at the end of one of his books, um, um, he basically announces the project of the next book. Um, and um, in fact, the genealogy of morality, the book that we're going to be looking at, says that it's a, quote, a supplement and clarification of his previous book, Beyond the Moon. Now, the one exception to what I just said, the one book that really is not well constructed, um, the one book that really does look like it is a random collection of aphorisms um, is the one book that Nietzsche didn't write, um, but was culled from his unpublished notebooks. And this was called The Will to Power, the book called The Will to Power. I'll say something more about this book later on. Um, but this is the one that is most often referred to um, when people say that they can just quote aphorisms randomly from, uh, from any context. And this kind of leads to my next point, which is this. Um, the secondary literature on Nietzsche divides very sharply among, uh, along many different dimensions. But one in particular I want to point to now. And this is whether Nietzsche should be read as what's often called a postmodernist, sometimes <coughs> thought of as the first postmodernist. And this reading of Nietzsche, which I'll describe in just a second, has had um, an enormous influence on those who are sympathetic to postmodernism. Um, who are sympathetic to this kind of project, um, including people like Foucault and Derrida, Gordy, um, Alexander Nianus, among others. But it's also of an interpretation of Nietzsche that's read, that, that's offered by people who reject or are opposed to postmodernism and therefore position themselves in opposition to Nietzsche. People like um, Habermas and So very roughly, the postmodernist interpretation says that Nietzsche's ultimate lesson, the ultimate goal, his ultimate teaching, is a combination of two different views, uh, what's sometimes called perspectivism and the will, to, uh, the will to power. So the will to power there is like a thesis, not the name of the book. Um, so on this interpretation, perspectivism says that there's no such thing as truth, or maybe there's no such thing as objective truth, but only well, truth from a perspective. You should hyphenate that, right? Truth from a perspective, not just truth. And this is understood, then, as a kind of subjectivism, undermining the possibility of objectivity or objective truth. Okay, and if we should do without truth, if there's no such thing as truth, if it's only what uh, an individual sees from his or her point of view, if truth is inaccessible or incoherent, um, then what should we be aiming at? And the answer, the the postmodern answer looks to the idea of the will to power to answer that question. So the idea is supposed to be that everything is characterized by a struggle for power. That what we should be doing, maybe we philosophers or we theorists, what we should be doing is uh, uncovering or unmasking or debunking or undermining the pretensions to truth that people present. Um, people present pretensions to truth or justice or morality. And what we should do is debunk those claims, unmask those.